Hi, this is Bob Samuels. I'm founder of Tech Connector. Tech Connector is a marketplace and campaign management platform of best of breed account based marketing solutions. We've partnered with the B2B Marketing Expo <clears throat> to bring you wisdom from leading account based marketing thought leaders. To that end, I'd like to introduce you to Samantha Stone. Samantha is founder of the Marketing Advisory Network, and she's also author of Unleash Possible. Unleash Possible looks like a nice marketing book, Samantha. Thank you. Um, it has really um, been a wonderful experience writing the book. It was um, sort of the culmination of, you know, more than a almost two decades of uh, work and really um, writing down, you know, my my thoughts and, and concept of how I, you know, attack the market and, and build go to market plans and things. And so um, but I wanted it to be, you know, very how to driven. So each chapter sort of talks about a concept and then it gives a case study and then it gives a bunch of how to guidelines. So uh, oh. feedback on it has been really wonderful. It's been a really valuable tool for me and, and help sharing how I think about marketing and sales. Beautiful, beautiful. So give, give me a little background, uh, your background on, in marketing. You've, uh, from, from your Facebook profile, you look really young. So you've probably been in for <laughs> maybe 5, 10, 15 years at the most. I love, uh, I love you, Bob, already. <laughs> right? So what is, it, what, is your, what, is your, what is your wisdom uh, based on? Yeah, so I had, so I'll give you just a very uh, quick history. I started actually my career um, in marketing completely by mistake. So I have a degree in economics. And when I graduated college, I was going to save the world through public policy research. I was going to make this huge uh, impact on the world that way. Um, the reality is uh, that's not a very uh, easy job to find, and they don't really want people right out of school doing public policy research. So while I tried to find myself and uh, started graduate school, I got a job at a software company, actually a temporary job originally. They ended up offering me a full-time job and offering to pay for grad school, um, which I gratefully accepted. And, um, and it was my first taste of uh, technology company. And I, I was actually in, this, in the sales division. And I spent a, very, a few years in channel and partner sales. And along the way, um, I was frustrated by um, what marketing was providing us. So I was doing a lot of my own marketing and my team was doing our own marketing. And eventually I comply, complained loudly enough and hopefully productively enough that they said, fine, Samantha, if you can do it better here, go own this. Um, and um, made a transition to marketing and I fell in love and it was really um, where I belonged. But because of my background in education and economics and because of my sales experience, I always felt that my marketing was from a different lens. I actually had never gone, taken a marketing class. I have since that time. But when I started marketing, I didn't have all these sort of preconceived notion about what marketing was supposed to be. And so I just was very analytical and I understood how sales worked and what the sales team and our buyers needed. And I just did stuff. And, you know, I broke some rules, not, not even intentionally. I just did the things that felt like they were right. And, it, and then um, became more disciplined, of course, over time as I learned the art and the science of marketing specifically and fell in love and did that for about 15 years. And then about seven years ago, I launched the Marketing Advisory Network. And the reason I did that was I loved the work that I was doing tremendously, but I wanted more flexibility in when I did it and where I did it. And I wanted more flexibility in being able to serve a lot of different clients at the same time. Um, I lo loved working for big companies and small companies, and I'd launched some new products to market as well as work for very large organizations. But the more senior I became, the less marketing work I was doing and the more internal politics I was doing. And I wanted to get back to doing marketing um, and helping companies grow. And so that's really what the genesis for the Marketing Advisory Network was and have been um, loving it ever since. That's a great story. I, I love the fact that it's based on starting off in sales. Yeah. It, everybody in the company is either in sales or they're in sales support. Yeah. It was really a wonderful backdrop to um, understanding 
uh, how marketing fit and worked. You know, when I first transitioned to marketing, I learned two things. One of the things I learned is it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be, right? I, I was expecting, you know, I thought I knew everything coming in a little bit. And um, I learned how challenging it could be. And the second thing I learned is how much I truly loved it. It was the first time in my career I had been good at what I was doing before. I had been advanced very quickly. I'd had great success. But I didn't really always love it. And when I moved into the marketing realm, I actually fell in love with my job and fell in love with my career and got to use all the things I had learned all the way leading to that point. And who, who could ask for anything better than that? It's like the best of all worlds when that happens. Absolutely. You're lucky. I'm very You're lucky. lucky. So, uh, so tell me, tell, tell me about uh, ABM from your perspective. Um, and the nice thing, you know, the ABM is apps to be driven by sales and it has to be highly coordinated with sales. And so that's uh, that's why I like your background so well. Yeah, thank you. You know, ABM is something that um, is really interesting. I have largely taken an ABM a approach for a good portion of my career, long before ABM was a thing or we knew what that word or phrases was. We called it lots of other things. We called it targeted accounts, marketing, named called account. moon, right? named account marketing. But there have been a couple of things that are very different in um, the more current incarnation where ABM really has come to be. And there's, and I, I think of that in two areas that have been incredibly helpful and important. One area is how we define and target our target market. In the past, we sort of were aspirational about the kinds of companies we think we want to work with, and hopefully it maps to our capabilities. But we weren't able to be very scientific about it, where there's a lot of intent-driven technologies out there today that can actually help us be much, much more refined in how we build a targeted account list. The second area, of course, is a whole bunch of support and technologies and also just media programs that allow us to focus our outbound efforts only to those companies. In the past, you know, when I first started doing things like that, it was hard to be able to run an ad program that was just to certain companies. I mean, I just couldn't do it, right? I just had to hope that I was going to get enough of them and ignore the other people. Or, you know, I, I couldn't really account score on an account. I could only account score an individual person. So lots of things have advanced that have made account-based marketing, I think, a really intelligent and effective tool for most organizations. Not everybody. It's not a fit for everything. But I think it adds value in many, many, many cases. Yeah. So, so you mentioned the, the value of, of intelligence and in, in the whole uh, success of it. Uh, you, you're speaking at the B2B MX on uh, the topic is authentic conversations in the age of artificial intelligence. So uh, I guess uh, using the artificial intelligence is both a blessing and a potential curse if, if you want to come across as human to your, to your audience. You know, that is a, a perspective that I probably went into. I've done a lot of research in this area over the last couple of years, and I went in pretty um, hesitant and, and pretty skeptical of what could happen. And I've actually come to the conclusion that AI used incorrectly absolutely can distance you from your customers, and it could be uh, terribly invasive, and it can create um, a lack of trust. But only if it's used incorrectly. Um, the, if we use artificial intelligence correctly, and I'll be, you know, this is exactly what this talk is about. It actually can help us be more human. It could actually surface connections and information and feedback to us in human to human conversations in ways that we could never do with automated rules based systems like our marketing automation systems traditionally provide. And yeah. that is unbelievably exciting. Now, I will also just mention that it's not just us as brands and vendors and companies that are going to be using artificial intelligence. Our customers are as well. And there are things like virtual assistants that are going to grow. And it's going to be an interesting challenge for us as marketers and as business leaders to know when we're talking to a real human and when we're talking to uh, automation on the other side. And so it's, um, it's going to change how we 
how we communicate and it's going to change how we do things. But I'm actually very, have a very positive outlook about what it will help us achieve. I'm positive. And I like it. So can you, can you, I know you're going to share some at your, at your speech, but can you give us a few examples of, of past uh, artificial intelligence use cases that you've seen that are pretty successful? Yeah, you know, I'll give you one example that I think is fantastic, and it speaks to this actually improving the human to human interaction. Uh, so, because so much of when we think about artificial intelligence, we think of sort of giving ourselves over to a machine and letting the machine do the work. Um, there is uh, an application that helps in call center. So I've got a human on the phone talking to a human. And what this artificial intelligence application does is it listens to the conversation and it picks up on cues of the conversation um, that many humans don't. So some very emotional, uh, emotionally sensitive humans are particularly good at picking up on verbal body language and understanding if somebody's getting frustrated or not. And certainly there are some things that are obvious, right? When somebody's voice gets very loud or they start cursing at us, we know they're frustrated, right? Um, but long before it gets to that point, there are subtle clues and it listens to tone of voice, pacing of language, um, spacing between words and phrases. It picks up on a bunch of things that a lot of humans on the other side of the phone might miss. And it prompts the call center staff with different scripting and different prompting points based on how they're interpreting what's happening on the other side of the call. And that makes for, instead of waiting until someone is sort of about to explode, um, it allows the call center person to hopefully avoid getting anyone to that, to that frustration point. And it's a wonderful way to enhance human communications, not replace the human touch. And that was, and that brings me to my next question about, uh, you know, common myths of uh, that people that, that hold people back from using the intelligence, and that's and that that's clearly one where they feel they need to give up entirely. It's either or, it's either human or artificial, as opposed to uh, enhanced or the best of both. Yeah, I'll give you another example. And this is, um, so there's a company called Drift. They make a, um, they don't call themselves a chatbot maker, but essentially the technology they have in their conversational marketing platform, part of what it does is provide a chatbot experience on a website. And, um, and it's driven by artificial intelligence underneath it because it recognizes who you are or who you likely are. And it surfaces different information based on that. And you go in and give it some guidance and some rules. But it all, so there's the AI running, um, but it also knows when to give you to a human, right? And you can tell it when to do that. And so there's this, again, great opportunity saying, look, look sometimes talking to a human is completely overrated, right? I just want to know what time the store opens. I probably don't need to talk to a human. I just want to see the balance of my account and I'm having trouble logging in. I may not need to talk to a human. So let me just do that transaction and get it done and be efficient in it. However, if in that process, all of a sudden it turns out my, um, looks like my account might have been hacked by somebody else and there's money missing. I now really want to talk to a human, right? I really need, this is an unusual situation. I'm, I have an emotional reaction to that. And so the system can be smart enough to now connect you to a human. So um, for me, this technology allows us to use human interaction where it is valuable and impactful and use automation and system communication where it is functional and it's not necessary to talk to a human. Yes. Well, um, I'm, this has been a great conversation, by the way. There's a few other things I wanted to talk about, but maybe we can leave them out as teasers uh, for your uh, presentation at the B2BMX. But, you know, I know you're going to talk about how to think about technology as an authenticity tool and, and also actual next steps to take back to the office. So if you want to leave a little teaser of, of forget to uh, give people a taste of what they're going to hear, um, that may be helpful. Yeah, you bet. One of the things we're going to spend a, a reasonable amount of time talking about is the bias in our data. So in order for artificial intelligence to be effective, it has to be trained on something. We need to show the technology 
a data set, a, a response set, so it knows what to do because it, you know, inherently needs to learn, just like we as children need to learn appropriate behavior in certain social situations, right? If anybody has a toddler in their life, you know they, you don't get born with proper etiquette, right? <laughs> so you have to train uh, that toddler. We have to train our technology similarly. Now it learns a lot faster than toddler in, in many ways and a lot less mess messily in a lot of ways, but it still needs to learn. And so we'll talk about what are the challenges of data and where are biases sit in our data that we may not even be consciously aware of and what's the impact of that. So that when we go back and we think about how to apply these technologies, we as marketers can be thinking about the right framework to be collecting the information that we're going to be needing in the future and to be doing it in a way um, that eliminates the natural bias that might exist in our systems today. Wonderful. Well, I, I look forward to seeing you at the uh, event, uh, your presentation Wednesday, the 27th at 1.35. Um, I, I recommend it. It's great. It sounds great. I'm going. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you, Samantha, and um, thanks for sharing everything. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I'm super excited about the conference. Um, it is a wonderful agenda and amazing folks will be there and I'm looking forward to seeing you in person there. Um, but it also happens to be in an amazing venue and coming from New England this time of year, um, getting a little bit of some nice weather and a little bit of a warmer uh, climate is, uh, is very exciting for me. So I get to talk about smart things, meet up with lots of uh, amazing people in person and I get to enjoy hopefully some sunshine and warm weather. Sounds all good to me. I'll see you there. I'll see you then. I can't wait.